hope that most of our families that have children are already planning to stay with us tonight as Bradley and Eli present some great things to us. You've heard a lot about it the past week or so. We live in an unsafe world and it's impossible to protect our children from everything, but tonight Bradley and Eli are going to help us out and they are going to be talking to our parents and our children, giving them some valuable information as to how our families can can maybe do a better better job of keeping an eye on our children at times. It, it, it's tough giving our children some advice of what they need to look for when 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 they're looking around and, and be, being aware of their surroundings and even if you didn't bring food tonight, we have plenty. So please, 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 if you have a child, if you're a parent, please stay with us tonight for this. You know, the, the, uncertain, the uncertainty and the uh, safety and well-being of our children kind of helps introduce our topic tonight that I want to share with you for the next few minutes. And I promise a lot of people that this is going to be a short sermon. I don't know. I have about four of you that are supposed to flag me down at a certain time if I've gone past because I know we have a lot of things after worship tonight that we need to get to and things like that. But I still hope that I, that the message is going to be very valuable to us all. But as we, as we discuss these things, I hope that you'll pay attention and, and really try to uh, apply some of these things as, as, as I've applied, tried my best to apply some of these to my learning and my, my knowledge as well. But I, I think back, our, our country is getting close, closer to its 250th birthday. And as we often refer to our, our founding fathers, those people who were there, they were the people who, who signed the Declaration of Independence who wrote the Constitution, our, our early presidents, all these folks, you, you look back at them, and when they decided they wanted to begin the United States of America, they were pretty much experimenting with something that had never been done before. There really wasn't a nation in the world at that time quite like the nation that they wanted to build. They wanted to build a nation that was free, but also a nation to where God was actively involved in, in the lives of the families in America. They were actually to the point to where they were looking for ways. Let's, let's look for ways. How can we insert God more into the public? It, it seems that maybe perhaps the past 50 years, uh, maybe we're going down from that. Uh, it seems to me as if maybe it seems to you that our country, instead of looking for ways to insert Jesus Christ into more of our lives, we're looking for ways as a country to, you know, how can we remove him? What else can we do to remove God, to, to keep from offending all these other people? What can we do? And it's, it's unsettling. It's, it's disturbing. And it, it makes us lose sleep at night. I hope it makes us do a lot of different things. And it's something that as Christians, you know, we don't, we don't like to think about. We don't like to think about a nation without God. And we see the news and we read the newspapers. If you're like me, you learn everything you need to know about the news on Facebook these days, right? Uh, a, a little too much sometimes. But, but we see these things and, and we think about our children. We think about our grandchildren. We think about those people coming after us and where our country is going from here. And so what about the future? And so as we kind of introduce tonight's topic, I dropped my index card because I had like seven pages of notes, and Betsy said, if you're going to have a short sermon, you have to get it down. I said, fine, I'll do it on an index card. <laughs> so maybe this will help me out some tonight as well. But Psalm chapter 11, verse 3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Listen to that again. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Question mark. Okay? So the basic foundations that our country was established on, they're being destroyed in some ways. And so there's a question. There's a question there for us. What can the righteous do? What can we do? And so in the, in the time that we have tonight, I'm going to put, put before you Seven things, seven things that I feel like that the righteous can do. Seven responses that we can have to all the negativity, all the things that we're seeing with, with the world trying to make us go further away from God. It seems at times, what are, five resp or what are seven responses that a Christian should have moving forward? And so if you're taking notes, there should be seven. Number one is something that Jeff talked a lot about this morning. 
and that is self-examination. I think self-examination is something that all of us cannot possibly do enough of. Uh, look at ourselves. You know, every morning when I wake up, I'm sure that I have the same routines as some of you, uh, as some of you have. I get up, I look at myself in the mirror, I make sure my hair looks good, you know, I look good this morning, so I, so I got up, I didn't look at it too long. Uh, you know, you look, you make sure there's nothing hanging out of your nose, right, nothing hanging out of your teeth. We all look inside of a mirror because we don't want to go out in public, you know, just looking what we feel like is horrible. And so if we want to examine our bodies, we look into a mirror what's the mirror for our soul? How can we tell, you know, what's on the inside? How can we tell and, and get a good examination of what our spiritual life is like? The Word of God, the Bible. This is our mirror. This is our mirror to the soul. And the more time that we spend looking at this, just like the time we spend looking at a mirror, the more time we spend looking at this, the better we will be, the better equipped, the, the more equipped we will be to have a better self-assessment uh, of, of what we are and what we need to do. There's nobody here that's perfect. None of us are perfect. All of us are working uh, together to try to reach the same goals. And all of us, if we look at ourselves and we look at the Bible, we can see, all right, here's some things we need to improve on. Here's some things we're doing okay in. Maybe we can do a little bit better. But we need to do some self-examination. And self-examination is always a very important thing. Uh, you think about the Sermon on the Mount. It talks a lot about judging. It talks about judging. And the same type of judgment that we will use, that we use towards others, will be used towards us. You know, it would be like yeah, if, if I walked up to Garrison, who did a really good job of, of reading tonight. I walked up to Garrison. I said, Garrison, you know, there's something, there's something about you that's, that's, that's bothering me. Let me tell you about this. And, and there's a little speck in his eye, as it talks about in Matthew chapter 7. There's a little speck in his eye, and I'm really focusing on that speck, and I have a big plank in my eye, he's going to say, well, Mr. Thad, you, you know, who are you to say anything? You have a big plank in your eye. You have to get rid of that plank before you can help me with this little bitty speck. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all have sin in our lives. We all have specks in our eyes, right? We all have specks in our eyes, and, and we're all trying to help each other get to the next point. But we need to get to that self-examination point of our lives to where we've examined ourselves, and now we're equipped to, all right, now we can start helping others because Jesus commands us to go and make disciples of all nations, right? Go, the word go and the word make involves action. So we have to get out, and and, and we have to help others. And, and a lot of times people are going to say, well, you know, who are you to judge? Who, you're, you're just being too judgmental. You don't know me. And you're right. You know, we don't know a person's heart. We, and we can't judge that. And those are, the, those are the realms that we're not supposed to step over into. But let's have a good self-examination of ourselves. If we have a plank in our eye, let's not sit around with it in our eye very long. Let's get it out so we can start helping other people because in the world that we live in, we, we really need each other and we need to hold each other accountable and help each other out as much as possible. So let's have a good self-examination of one another. So number one, we're going to self, we're going to examine ourselves. Number two, we're going to make sure that our house is secure. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. All you other people, you may go out, you may worship idols. I'm not sure what you're going to do, okay? But I can tell you what I'm going to do. I can tell you what my family's going to do. We're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to make God a priority. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Parents, the most valuable mission trip that you ever make is to the bedroom of your child to share with them the Word of God, to share a prayer with that child. That's the most valuable mission trip uh, any of us as parents will ever go on, and we should never think differently. And we can go a lot of places and do a lot of great things, but if we neglect our family, you know, you, you, what, 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 have, what have we done? What have we done? And so the home is a very important place. And you know what? We have some great programs here at Tuscumbia, and you parents do an excellent job of making sure that your children are involved, your children come to activities, your children come to devotionals. Whenever you're able to be there, you do a gr good job of making sure your children are there. Uh, you, you surround your children with as many spiritual opportunities as possible. But at the end of the day, what, what are we doing at home? 
What are we doing at home? Are we leaving this place and, and, and are we going home and saying, well, you know, Mr. Thad's teaching them at, at, at church and Jeff and Jordan and, and their Bible class teachers in downtown Bible and they're getting this and they're getting that and, you know, we're too busy during the week. We don't have enough time during the week. Um, our, everybody's lives are crazy and, and, and we're just not making the time but the thing is we have to make the time at, at, at home we have to as parents we have to invest that time in, into our children and I want, want you to know from my perspective you guys are doing a phenomenal job uh, Betsy and I are not anywhere close to perfect parents and we learn something new every single day usually from something that we observe from the good job that you are doing with your children and, and I want you to know that and I want you to continue to keep up the good work look for just a moment at Deuteronomy chapter 6 you've heard this uh, a bunch of times Deuteronomy chapter 6 starting in verse 6 these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. What should we do with them? Impress them. Where? On your children. When do we talk about them? Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Can we extend the verse? You know, when we're, when we're driving down the road, going on vacation, when we're driving to the restaurant, when we're eating Sunday lunch. You know, what... Every time we pick our children up from class, uh, one of the first questions should be, what did you learn in class? And I know as well, well as you know, you know, children aren't, aren't always going to remember. They're not always going to be able to tell you. And so, you know, ask, ask the teacher. They can't tell me. So what, what did they learn in class? Well, today we studied about parables, okay? I'm going to do a really good job at home of re reinforcing parables in, in our home Bible studies. And, and maybe, and, and I'm going to talk to my child and encourage them to be better listeners. And you'll be amazed at, at the results. And our children ha have learned to be really good listeners. And they're very smart. And we should make it a habit as parents to ask them what did you learn what can you teach me what can you share with me the home is a very valuable place and and way too many parents are, are as Jeff said this morning you know let's let's blame this person let's blame this person why my child didn't why my child didn't we have to stay on top of it we have to stay on top of it as parents and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do everything in my power to help each and every child in this congregation reach their full potential. And I hope that every parent here is going to do the same for me as we try to bring up Will and Mary Kate because we can't do it on our own. We, we need your help. And I'm going to be there to help you, and I hope that you're going to be there to help me, and we're going to be there to help each other, and we're going to make sure that our house is a place. And let's keep teaching each other. Let's keep teaching each other. All right, so we're going to give ourselves a good self-examination. We are going to make sure that if nothing else in the country changes, that our house is going to be a house to where Jesus lives and where God is seen on a daily basis. And number three, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Those founding fathers that we talked about earlier, in the seven years of the Revolutionary War, it, there's at least nine times that it's documented that those, those founding fathers, those folks, set aside days for the country to stop working, stop working in the field, stop doing what you're doing, do nothing that day except spend the day in prayer. I don't see that anymore. You know, our country's in distress. I, I do not see people saying, all right, everybody stop what you're doing. Don't go to work today. Let's stay at home and let's pray. Let's pray. But we as Christians, we can do that. We, we can do that. We can be the ones who pray and... It may not be as common as it used to be everywhere else in the world, but it needs to be common where we are. If you think about the Israelites while they were living in Egypt, they were ready to leave. They were ready to, to get out of there. They were ready to get back to the home of, of Abraham. And what were they doing? They were constantly crying out to God. They were crying out to God. Why were they crying out to God? Well, they were crying out to God because they wanted relief. They wanted God to help them. And God did not answer their prayer with a yes as soon as they wanted to answer that prayer. Look at Luke chapter 18 for just a moment and look at what our response should be thinking about how the Israelites did. Uh, Luke chapter 18 verse 7 <clears throat> And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who do what? Who cry out to him day and night. Those who cry out to God day and night. God's going to hear them. God's going to deliver them. The deliverance may not always be what we want it to be. 
It wasn't always for the Israelites, you know. There were sometimes, unfortunately, the other other folks took over the Israelites to, to prove a point. And, and I hope that that's not going to be the case with the United States of America. I hope we have not gone that far down that road yet. And I hope that there's still a lot that us Christians can do. But we are to be crying out to God day and night. We are to be in prayer. This stuff matters. This stuff matters. Our children and their children and their children and their children after them, it matters. And so we want to do as much as we can with the life that we have to help them as much as possible and to help our country as much as possible. And so we're going to give ourselves a self-assessment. We are going to make sure that our house is in order and we are going to pray. That's number three. Number four, number four, we're going to learn the Bible. We're going to learn the Bible. And we've kind of talked a little bit about this already, and I keep mentioning those founding fathers, but if you go back and look, all of our presidents for a pretty large spell of time, plus all those folks assigned all these great things and, and, and helped us do a lot of great things some 250 years ago, you can find quotes upon quotes upon quotes about how important the Bible was to these people. And they knew it was not just important for them, but they knew it was important for future generations because this grand idea of the United States of America, remember, this is an experiment. This is something that really had never been done before. And every single one of these people will pretty much tell you as long as you keep God as a focus and his word as the focus, this experiment can be successful. This, this United States thing that we're trying to do can be successful, but if you rip the Bible out and you stop teaching our children the things that we find inside the word of God, they admit it. It's, it's not going to work. It's eventually going to crumble to pieces. And it's our jobs as parents. You know, if they're not getting it from their school, we have got to feed them as much as we possibly can before, before it's too late. Uh, from the time they are born till the time they leave us and even after they leave us. You know, if your children are 50 years old, I, I hope that we are still in some way working on them and trying to help them. And so we have to learn the Bible. When we learn the Bible, we learn that, you know, the Bible doesn't teach us to react to the situation by just sitting back. Uh, the Bible teaches us to react to the situation in a way that I said earlier, to go and make disciples of all nations, to, to share with others the Word of God. You think about, you think about Paul, uh, not Paul, but Peter, I mean Paul too, but Peter in, in, in Acts chapter, chapter 2. You read Acts chapter 2 and you read that sermon that he's, he's preaching right there, he's pretty bold. He's pretty bold. I, I've never heard anybody speak with that type of, of boldness. Sorry, Jeff. I mean, he does a, you do a great job. But, you know, Peter is, is just laying it out, you know, and it's, it's almost in a way that, that we, don't, we don't use, okay? He, he, he's not too concerned. It doesn't seem about feelings. Um, I think we should be concerned about feelings, but what he did on that day did enough, to prick people to the heart, to where they were cut to the heart, and to where so many people became Christians on that day. And, and we need to make sure that we, we know the Word of God, and we preach the Word of God, sometimes with great boldness, with love in our heart. We speak the truth in love. We, we hit people with a whole lot of Jesus, with a whole lot of Jesus, and, and we try to help them out, because there's a lot of lost sheep out in the world. And I like to think of... My family here at the Ch Tuscumbia Church of Christ as the sheepfold. You know, this is where I can come. This is the, these are the people I can be around to get away from the riffraff that's going on in the world. We're among the sheepfold. We're among those 99 who hopefully are, are safe. But there are people out there that we need to help bring back into the sheepfold. So we're going to give ourselves a self-examination. We're going to make sure our house is where it needs to be. We're going to pray. We're going to learn our Bibles. We're going to learn that, that we need to hold each other accountable and help each other. And number five, we need to have a voice. Have a voice. This is number five, right? We need to have a voice. There are way too many silent Christians in the world, and you think about what's becoming more and more accepting as time goes on. 
you know, Betsy and I were had started watching a TV show before uh, we had kids, and we got to like season four or five, and it was like, bam, you know, they introduce you with this homosexual couple and all these different things going on. It's like they get you hooked on the show, and then bam, they introduce you to something that's controversial out out in society, and and make it to where, hey, I want to find out what happens next, but I don't really want to watch this show anymore. And, and, and we're all probably put in those situations from time to time, but we see things being promoted out in the world, gambling, drunkenness, um, all type of sins that are being more and more accepted in the world today. But doesn't it seem like that there are two things right now that are sticking out uh, specifically tied to our government more than anything else? Can you think of them? Abortion and homosexuality. Is that what came to your mind? That's kind of what came to my, my mind. And those are two things that Christians are fighting right now. And I think, you know, since abortion was made legal in 1973 in the United States, um, well over 50 million children have been sacrificed on the altar that we call abortion. Over, if, if the blood of Abel after being killed by Cain, after, if that blood was an outcry to the Lord that the Lord heard, then I imagine that these 50 million plus babies, their outcry has to be deafening, has to be deafening to God. And, and it's sad. It's sad that, that this is the world that we live in today. I, you probably heard the story, but it's this um, mother who was, she was 21 weeks um, along in her pregnancy, she was having a little boy. She was ha- his name was Samuel. He had spinal spinal bifida, spinal bifida, yeah, spinal spinal bifida. And so the uh, doctors in Nashville went to do surgery on this baby while the baby was still inside the womb. And there is a classic picture of as the doctor as the doctor's doing the surgery, this baby reaches out. All right grabs the doctor by the finger and squeezes. And there were photographers there because this was kind of a surgery that, that hadn't been done before. They took a picture of it, and you've probably seen it. I think the first place I saw it was on Facebook a few years ago, and, and grabs the, the finger of this doctor. And the thing is, the surgery went well. Fifteen weeks later, the baby is born, healthy, everything's great. But you can't tell me that 15 weeks earlier, while that baby was still in the womb, while that baby could reach out and grab the finger and squeeze the finger of that doctor, that baby was not a person. That baby did not matter. That baby does, did matter. And that baby does matter, as all babies do, to, to God. And it is a bad thing that we are seeing in our world today, that we offer life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to everybody, maybe too many people, but yet we have these children that we're not even given the right to life. And, and, and so, you know, this Thursday, this Thursday, we're going to the Blackwell Lake House, and we are, he has a bald eagle's nest. If I were to climb up the tree to that bald eagle's nest, and there was an egg in there, and I took it, and I threw it down to the ground, I would be put in prison. I would be put in prison. That unborn bald eagle egg has more rights as an American than the unborn child has. And that's sad to me. That is sad to me. And I care about birds just as much as anybody. But it's sad to me that, that they have more rights. If you take the population of the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, you take the population of all those 20 states today and you put them together, that's how many children America has lost to abortion about since 1973. And that is a sad, sad thing for us. And it's something that we need to fight as Christians. And, and, and the other thing, if you'll look with me really quick, I'm getting my first hand up that I'm getting close to my time. Romans chapter 1. I'm not going to go into a whole sermon about homosexuality, because you know it's wrong. We all know that it's wrong, but let's, let's look at this, because they took a survey last year. I'm sure it's not accurate or whatever completely, but it, it said that about 1.6% of Americans were living in homosexuality. 1.6%. Now, you would think 
You know, all those people who are, are waving the flags and, and doing everything that it would be far more. But here's why you think that. You think that because now there's also a statistic that over 50% of America, over 50% of America support the actions of those who practice that lifestyle. Many of that, those 50% are people who claim to be Christians. Look, at me, look with me at the last few verses of Romans chapter 1, starting verse 26. Um, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged nat- natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their error. Let's skip down to the last verse of the chapter, verse 32. Although these people knew God's righteous decree and those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things but also approve of those who practice them. So, here in this situation, we, we have these people who are committing these horrible sins that we've just talked about, okay? But who does it put in the same category in the last verse? Those who approve of those who practice sin. The ones who approve. And we can't. We, we can't approve of sin. We help people. We, we lovingly help people as best as we can and bring them where they need to be. We separate the sin from the sinner. And we understand that this is a person who, who makes mistakes just like you, I make mistakes, just like you make mistakes. And we do everything in our power to help them without telling them, hey, I, I approve of your actions. I approve of your actions. It's okay that you're that way. It's not okay. It's never okay when we are living in sin. And so... We want to give ourselves a self-examination. We want to make sure our house is in order. We're going to pray. We're going to learn our Bibles. We're going to have a voice. And this la- these last two I'll go through quickly. Number six, we're going to boycott filth. We're going to boycott filth. As I was saying earlier, you know, if we turn on the radio and we hear a song that talks about, yeah, I kissed a girl and I liked it or whatever it might be, that's not the kind of stuff we're going to let our children listen to. That's not the, the kind of stuff that we're going to listen to. We're not going to buy those kinds of CDs. We're not going to purchase uh, movies that promote those things. We're not going to continue to watch television shows that continue to throw sin in our face. If there's companies out there who are actively supporting sin, maybe there, there's a way that we can stop supporting some of those, those companies. We want to be consistent. If we stop supporting this company because they give millions of dollars to support this sin, then we need to, to, to look at this other one and, and try to be as consistent as we can. And we're not going to be perfect, but the idea is to fill our lives with as much good as we can and make sure that as much as depends on us, our money is not going to go to support things that do not support God. And last point is do not do not give up. America did not get in the shape that it is in right now overnight. It took a long time, and it may take some time. If you remember, the children of Israel continued to cry out. All, all we can do is continue to have a voice and continue to cry out to God and, and hope that he delivers us back to what we want to be. You know, a, a loud Christian sometimes is, is offensive to God, uh, is offensive to the world, but, but a silent Christian sometimes is, is offensive to God. And I hope that none of us are going to be silent. Now, I don't, I don't mean get up on top of your roof and point your finger and say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. That's not how we do it. That's not how we show them the love of Christ. There's, there's a way of doing this and showing them the love of Christ and leading them gently and, and, and helping them to understand in love what we're trying to teach them. But, you know, the other day we were at the Blackwell Farm and, and Jeff looked at me and he, he said, Brother, I want to tell you. He said, if, if I'm out and I see you and you're, you're dressed like a woman, he said, I love you enough <laughs> to tell you that that's not how you should be dressing. And I hope that we all love each other enough to where if we see something and we can help somebody, you, we don't take each other as being judgmental. We may say things in the wrong way sometimes. We may do things in the wrong way. There's always a better way of doing things. But as long as our concern is to help one another 
and to help each other reach heaven and to s- truthfully say what we're saying because we love each other. That, that's, that's all we need to do. And, and that's all that can be expected out of us. I love you so much that, that I'm not going to sit here and watch sin destroy your life without saying something to you. And I hope that you love me that much too to where if I'm doing something, I'm living in a sin that could, could potentially destroy my life, you will come to me and I'm not going to say, oh, you know, get this out of your eye, you're being too judgmental. I'm going to be thankful and I hope that you would respond the same way, even if it's not always uh, presented in the best way that that person could possibly do it. We need to respond. What shall the righteous do? I've given seven things that I feel like we can do uh, to help ourselves moving forward with our children, with our families, in, in, in the country that we live in today. Jeff said it best. I don't remember if it was earlier this week when he said it, but I've been to Ukraine three times, and every time I come back from Ukraine, I find myself just wanting to kiss the ground kiss the ground. But there's times I'm here in America and I've been been away from that for a long time. I'm like, I just want to get out. I just want to go somewhere else. And, and we do have a lot of blessings here in the United States. We, we do have brave men and women who have and will continue to, to fight for our freedoms. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for so many things about our country. But what can, I, can Christians do? We can give ourselves a self-examination. We can make sure that our house is in order. We can pray more. We can study our Bible more. We can finally have a voice. We can boycott anything that that looks filthy in the eyes of God. And, And more than anything, we need to make sure that we do not give up. If you were here tonight,